demons. Uh, it's not a, a movie, and uh, but it does have a little bit of a, uh, of a setup that involves uh, some kind of science. Uh, I got kind of interested in it uh, because the uh, the science that comes at the very beginning uh, talks about the Large Hadron Collider, which is a new particle accelerator uh, in Europe, and uh, and that was that was very uh, prominent at the very beginning of the movie. Uh, it's a bad guy movie, so um, you know, most of the movie's not about physics. Uh, which is why people like to go see it. <laughs> so, um, I don't know a whole lot about uh, um, uh, Dan Brown or all the, uh, uh, the the books that he's written, but you know, they usually they involve the Vatican, and usually there's some bad guys in the Vatican, and uh, uh, that's, that's, that's the, the basic premise of all Dan Brown uh, books. <laughs> uh, what I thought I'd do is first set us up with uh, a little bit about what the movie's about, and then we can sort of parse out uh, a little bit about uh, the physics that's going on. It was kind of amazing the timing of this uh, movie, and maybe it was deliberate, but uh, some of you might know the Large Hadron Collider, this uh, accelerator that's featured in the movie, actually turns on this year. So this is kind of a, a big moment within the physics community. A lot of us are very excited about this new instrument. Uh, some dub it as the largest scientific instrument ever built. And uh, so it's kind of a big moment for us. And, you know, imagine a lot of this and everything getting all excited about uh, a new, new instrument. But it's just that relaxing. So uh, let me start by uh, setting up what the movie is. Okay. So I'm going to show uh, the trailer for the movie, and uh, then we can, we can talk a little bit uh, after that. from an old enemy. Find Professor London. He exposed one of the greatest cover-ups in human history. Da Vinci. But what terrifying discovery would make the Vatican turn to him? That's the Illuminati. The Illuminati were a secret society dedicated to scientific truth. The Catholic Church ordered a brutal massacre to silence them forever. They've come for their revenge. There's a hidden trail through Rome itself. I need access to the Vatican archives. Access to the archives is only by written decree by the Holy Father. Fellas, you called me. This is the first sign. What sort of sign? Earth, air, fire, water. And the fifth sign. May God forgive you for what you've done. Father, God has issues. They won't be with what we've done. They won't be with what we're about to do. Our church is at war. Hey! This is the first marker. The path is alive. You're talking about the moment of creation. Open the doors and tell the world the truth. and demons. Uh, CERN, and CERN is a, uh, an international 
National Laboratory. Uh, it's uh, just outside of Geneva, Switzerland, and it's, a, it's opposed to several particle accelerators. Um, it's a rather old laboratory now. It looks really glamorous in the movie. There are lots of fancy looking buildings, and um, any of you who have ever seen a physics department, those of you who are not physics majors, <laughs> not too many glamorous buildings around here. Uh, those of you who are physics majors are keep wondering, where are the buildings that don't involve cinder block walls? That's the one I want to be in. Um, the real CERN laboratory uh, has so much more modest uh, uh, accommodations. It's a, it's a beautiful place, though. You're out uh, just outside the, the, the mountains, and if you're looking up from that picture, you can see uh, the mountains straddling Switzerland and France. So in that sense, it's very nice to be there, much uh, nicer than the particle accelerator I worked at outside Chicago, where you see the plains of the Midwest. Uh, but not particularly a top-secret laboratory by any stretch. CERN was started in 1954, and it was uh, an idea that had been kicked around for, for several years by several very prominent European scientists. Some of you might know the name Niels Bohr. Uh, he was one. Uh, others include Pierre Roger, who amongst the uh, physicists is a very prominent name. Uh, but the final proposal that got developed and then sent on to UNESCO, for some of you who know what UNESCO is, uh, was done um, uh, by Louis de Broglie, another Nobel Prize winning physicist. And the idea at the time was to thought, find some avenues to develop international collaboration amongst the nations of Europe, which literally eight years before had been blowing the crap out of each other. So this was a pretty revolutionary thing to have done. And again, the, the, the goal here was to try to heal the wounds of World War II. So it was very much from the beginning set up as, a, as an avenue for international collaboration. That's a really remarkable thing. We don't even have that in the U.S. When there's a major new project going uh, announced but from the federal government, instantly you see states shooting at each other. Uh, not quite literally, but you know, there's competition to get the new projects. And we don't even have always the same level of collaboration within the United States as, uh, as the present uh, within the nations of Europe. So it's a, it's a remarkable enterprise. Uh, today it has grown from uh, 12 member states which organize and operate the laboratory to uh, 20 what are called member states uh, that operate the laboratory and sit on the council that govern CERN. And there are about 9,000 scientists uh, that are routinely used CERN uh, from around the world. That's a big number. Um, there are even a thousand of them from the United States that want to go over and be uh, participants in the, in the project of the large pattern collection. So it's a big fraction of the community I work in and others here um, in the department work in uh, that are going to do their science overseas at this new facility. In the movie, you see, uh, as, as toward the beginning, uh, the secret scientists doing their secret kind of work. And uh, one of the more realistic depictions of the, of the movie is they show the control room where they're going to dial up the antimatter. And that's actually not a bad depiction of what real life looks like. They have these fancy looking computer monitors and nice iridescent blue there. And they have all the scientists in their lab coats. And that's not going to be realistic. Uh, I don't know if many of us wear lab coats anymore. Uh, but the right hand picture over here is the actual control room of the Large Hadron Collider uh, in, in Geneva. So it's not so different. There are uh, three very large pods there where a number of uh, or teams of people are sitting around a bunch of computer monitors. And each computer monitor is accessing or monitoring some key part of the accelerator, be it the, the cryogenics or the magnets or uh, instrumentation of trying where the beam is. Everyone's got their little piece. This kind of looks like a, a control room in Johnson Space Center or something like that. So that's a very realistic part of, of the movie. And uh, these people are all sitting there as chaos around the, the control room when things are really starting up, also kind of like in the movie. Uh, one thing that's actually quite false in the movie is, uh, in the left-hand picture here, right outside those windows was, were the experiments that were going on in the large pattern collider. So car particle collisions were happening right there, and you could watch them so looking through the window. <laughs> you would never see that uh, at CERN because the actual accelerator is located some 300 feet below ground where it's safe. So all accelerators uh, you know, are generally located well away from where people are because there are particles colliding, which means there's ionizing radiation flying all over the place, and you don't want to be near that. So the actual control room is actually a couple of miles uh, from any access point of the CERN accelerator, and you aren't anywhere near it. You're accessing everything. All the information is coming 
through electronics, up cables, up through mine shafts, and out of the control room. In fact, you don't even have to be there a couple of miles from the accelerator. There's another control room outside of Chicago. There's uh, the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory where I do a lot of my work. Uh, there's another major accelerator lab that I've built this year that's been the largest accelerator uh, in the world. And there's a separate control room uh, at Fermi Labs that again monitor all the equipment going on at CERN. And uh, just like you know, you, you go and get your uh, x-rays at the dentist's office uh, in the afternoon and they are sent off probably overseas to some dentist in India or China or someplace and they're being studied overnight and by the time you come back this morning you know you have a full analysis of how many cavities you have. In the same way, there are physicists in the United States uh, working uh, during the daytime for us, but that's evening for CERN. And so uh, you have people able to collaborate and uh, contribute to the operations of the experiments uh, during the daytime for them. I don't think there's yet a, a similar control room being set up in Asia, but if it was, then you could have a situation where the sun never sets in the large hydro collider. It's always being monitored by someone, uh, be it remotely, uh, but someone who for whom it's daytime, and then you don't have to be working through the night anymore, which is the, the typical norm for uh, four students in physics to have to go work on part of the Okay, so a lot of this is made possible because of you know the, the advances in computing and the internet. So what is it they're monitoring? They're monitoring the, what will be the world's largest accelerator. So uh, that's a picture on my left here. Uh, oh, that's my left. Yeah. Um, over there, uh, of, of the tunnel that's now 300 feet below ground, those big blue things are the magnets that are steering a high-energy proton beam around in a circle. And you notice the tunnel kind of looks like it's veering off to your left a little bit. It's not a straight tunnel, it's a circular tunnel. And Well, over here is a, a sort of map of the accelerator complex at CERN, and there's actually several accelerators. So uh, a very high energy proton beam actually starts with a very modest proton beam, i.e. A, a, a bottle of hydrogen gas, and you zap it and you start making it go faster and faster until it becomes a very high energy proton beam. So uh, in this picture it says sources and linux, you have literally a gas bottle of hydrogen, and uh, there's a small linear accelerator that ramps it up to a little tiny ring uh, that that accelerates the beam up to a modest energy that's called the proton synchrotron booster. Then it goes into another bigger ring called the proton synchrotron, labeled PS. And it goes into an even bigger ring, gets up to an even higher energy than the super proton synchrotron. Uh, that's been accelerated for about 30 years now. And it goes into this new ring called the large hydrogen collider. And what's happening is that there's a proton beam going one way around the ring, and then there's a separate proton beam going around the other way around the ring, and about somewhere around the uh, the, the, the ring they brought in to collide. And these are very energetic collisions, and the idea is to create a really high temperature environment, kind of like what would have existed at the very beginning of the universe, kind of like the Big Bang. So this big thing is really big. This picture uh, here is something that CERN publicizes a lot because it means a lot to people in Europe. That's the town of Geneva, and you can see lots of roads and farmland. And the background is Lake Geneva, uh, and then they've drawn in red uh, what the large hydrogen collider would look like if it was on the surface. And of course, it's on the ground, so you can't see it. Um, so, us, maybe that doesn't mean a whole lot, so I've drawn the same size circle on Austin, Texas. And uh, kind of keep in mind that the very top of that picture is where UC is, little A from Google Maps up there. And the very bottom of the picture is Austin Bergstrom Airport. So, that's about the size of, of this accelerator model. It's about 17 miles in circumference. So a very fast printer could probably get around the large hydrogen collider in a couple of hours. Uh, the protons do it in about 10,000 of a second. They're moving at the speed of light, but very close to it. So it's, it's really, really big. That's why people call it the world's largest scientific instrument. There's never been uh, such a big tool as this uh, ever made. And it goes up to really, really high energies with these protons specifically. So like I said, uh, at several points around this ring, uh, the protons are made to collide into one another, and these are really energetic collisions. The, the, the debris of junk that's coming out of these collisions, all those particles are also have, having tons and tons of energy. And if you want to record the splash that's created every time a proton hits another proton at that energy, you're going to have to stop everything and, and measure all the particles that come out. So 
for the instruments that record those collisions are also huge. So there are two such instruments, one called, goes by the name of ACLIPS and the other one goes by the name of CMS, and don't worry about what the acronyms are, but these detectors are big enough that you can just barely see a little tiny person uh, standing at the center of each of those two little apparatus. So right on that catwalk, the blue catwalk, the left picture, there's a man standing in a hard hat and a lab coat. On the right hand picture, uh, there's another person standing on a, a gondola, on a yellow gondola there, and it can give you a human candlestick to, to judge how big these things are. These are huge uh, apparatus, and they're built by literally thousands of people. So imagine lots of little Egyptians like us who've been building with some little piece of this instrument and then flying it over to CERN where it eventually gets assembled. And literally this is assembling ships in a bottle, okay, because these things are deep underground. People have been building this thing for literally a decade. So imagine your PhD depends on that. <laughs> and the kinds of things we're doing, uh, well this is a computer simulation of what a collision would look like. You just see a spray of stuff by eye. But they're looking for exotic things that would have been around at the beginning of the universe. Uh, we'll hear later about the big boson and other things that uh, go on at that time. But we were trying to recreate in the laboratory a sort of micro version of the big thing. I said earlier these, uh, these beams have an energy of 14 TeV. Well, that's probably not a very meaningful unit to us because I don't know if how many of us know what a TeV is. But TeV, the T stands for tera electron volt. Tera means 10 to the 12, I think it is. Yeah. Um, so what's an electron volt? Well, if you were to try to scale it to things that we do know, uh, particles in a blast furnace operating at a couple thousand degrees Celsius those have an energy on the order of an EV, a little bit less than that. So I think of a blast energy, a blast one is a kind of energetic thing. A Tesla coil uh, can zip particles up to an even larger energy, actually, about 25,000 electron volts. And actually here, let me pause and say, I don't know if you've ever seen these Tesla coils, but uh, these things uh, get up to incredibly high voltage, 25,000 volts, and then they just emit these zaps of lightning that go across the air. And they're, they're, they're such a big zap you can't hear it. And there's a group in Austin that has a pair of these things and they literally play music. So these zaps play at different pitches that they want to tune them in different ways. And actually later in the semester, the department's going to have a big open house, which you all are welcome to come. Uh, you can tour around some of the labs here in the building. Uh, but after, uh, after that tool, set of tours, uh, the, the, the student physics group is going to have a, it's going to host uh, this Austin group called Architect that's going to have singing Tesla coils. Uh, so yeah, Tesla coils are still pretty modest energies. Some of you may have heard of a Van de Graaff accelerator. Uh, you can accelerate particles up to the millions of electron volts, so that's one with six zeros, uh, with a Van de Graaff accelerator. And Fermilab, uh, the, the lab where I worked at outside Chicago, shows another million of a million electron volts, so it's a, a thousand big electron volts. That's big enough where when Fermilab is an accident and the proton beam goes the wrong way, it starts burning holes and things. Okay, so that picture with a little dental tool there that the little dental here, uh, the person is looking at a hole that has been bored in the side of the, of the, of the brain by the, the proton beam when they actually lost control one day. And they actually lost several magnets and the proton beam has kept on going right through a wall, right into dirt, and now you understand why proton beams are located 300 people around. <laughs> Well, CERN is bigger than that. CERN is 14 TeV, so uh, another factor of 10 beyond where Fermilab is. And at that point, people get really, really worried because now you're really storing a lot, a lot of energy. And I remember when I was a graduate student and Fermilab was just turning on the Tevatron ring, which was this ring that I've been working on for all these years, there were various facts uh, producing theories where there's so much energy being stored and the, the collisions are such high energy, someone was worried that we were going to create black holes right there in the laboratory and consume Chicago. <laughs> None of us were too concerned, but the same people were then conjecturing when Brookhaven turned on an even bigger accelerator uh, in the mid 90s that yes, they're going to create black holes again. And this time they filed a lawsuit. Oh boy, I mean, we can get the legal system in the United States going, that's, that's a bigger deal. Uh, and then it happened again with CERN this year. So it turns out people got even more worried. Uh, and uh, so they filed a lawsuit, and, and sure enough, that's what made the media. Now, you don't really hear about scientific discoveries in the media a whole lot, but we do hear about lawsuits. And so this got picked up by MSNBC, it got picked up by the New York Times, and I found it amazing that they flatly reported on it, all this as if it was news. 
because frankly it's all quackery. And I don't know if you found this to, uh, to be in the case in, uh, in things you know about, but if you actually want a real good reporting on it, you need to go to the Daily Show. So um, I'm going to play a short clip for you um, uh, from the Daily Show where they actually talk about the Large Hadron Collider and about claims about black holes being created that have consumed the universe. So uh, let's, let's, let's play that one. <laughs> Now, oddly enough, you have to go to the Daily Show to get probability lessons that are better than the Nietzsche Spice. Uh, the best report I saw from a particle physicist wasn't nearly as good, but they have in a lot of these uh, CERN experiments these live webcams because for years people have been building these things. And you could sort of watch their progress as these little ants were going up and putting some new table up there. And uh, one of them in the UK actually had this joke uh, webcam that he put up. And I'll just show it to you now. So it's, it's meant to be a spoof of a webcam watching uh, one of the detectors being assembled. And so here's a webcam down below the ground where the detector is and then above. that camera number 86. It's wireless. It too was stolen. It could be anywhere inside the Vatican walls. That canister contains an extremely combustible substance called antimatter. We need to locate it immediately or evacuate Vatican City. I'm quite familiar with incendiaries, Ms. Vetra. I've never heard of antimatter being used as such. Well, it's never been generated in significant quantities before. It's a way of studying the origins of the universe to try to isolate what some people call the God particle. But there are implications for energy the research. God particle? What we call it isn't important. It's what gives all matter mass, the thing without which we could not exist. You're talking about the moment of creation. Yes, in a way I am. The antimatter is suspended there, in an airtight nanocomposite shell with electromagnets on each end. But if it were to fall out of suspension and come in contact with matter, say the bottom of the canister, then the two opposing forces would annihilate one another violently. And what might cause it to fall out of suspension? The battery going dead which it will, in six hours. What kind of annihilation? How violent? A cataclysmic event. A blinding explosion equivalent to about five kilotons. The Vatican City will be consumed by light. All right. <laughs> um, so there's lots of uh, science lingo there. They talk about antimatter, and they talk about the origins of the universe and the God part of which is a great one. Uh, and then uh, Vatican City being consumed by light. So uh, there's lots of uh, lingo there being thrown in together, more or less uh, in random order. So maybe I thought we'd take that <laughs> part a little bit. Talk a little bit about what antimatter we use. So, um, sorry, I just what I want to do. Uh, that's it. So, um, this is your part of physics lecture for the evening. There will be a quiz at the end. Um, all of us have learned probably in high school about the periodic table of the elements and how we assemble the universe out of 118 or something like that, uh, different atoms. Uh, but so part of this is the atom is just another composite structure that we can take apart. And we like to do that with a hammer. So the actual building blocks of all the universe are these particles called either quarks or leptons, and they have somewhat whimsical names like the up and the down and the charm and the strange and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are 12 of them in total, and but depending on what order you, as, you assemble them in, you can make things like a proton or a neutron, uh, largely out of up quarks and down quarks. Most of these particles we don't know very well because they are around. In fact, 
the universe largely just has three of them, because the really big ones, the heavy ones, have since decayed away. They were all around at the beginning of the universe, but they decay. And they decay largely into the lighter particles, so the up down and the electron things that we know about today. So we, we can make protons and neutrons out of the work. You can stick a couple of protons and neutrons together and you make a nucleus of an atom. And then uh, if you have a little electrons orbiting around that, that's the atom. Okay. So this is what most of us know about uh, the three of the 12 elementary particles. But the thing that you need to know about for, if you really want to understand angels and demons, because you know, we all want to approach it at a deeper level, uh, is that all particles actually have partners. So, <laughs> every particle, for every particle, there's something called the antiparticle. And the antiparticle wouldn't be all that distinguishable from the particle, except there are a few properties that are the opposite. So the anti-electron, uh, as Roxana was telling us, uh, is the positron. And the positron is in every way the same as the electron, except it has a positive charge instead of a negative charge. That the antiproton would have a negative charge instead of a positive charge. And these things all uh, kind of have their anti-partner out there. There's nothing special about matter and antimatter except that we happen to know one kind a lot more than we know the other kind. What's special for the movie is that when matter and antimatter kind of come in contact with one another, they annihilate, which is a nice great word, annihilate. You know, it's a good word. Uh, what really happens is they go into making energy. And um, that energy can come in various forms. If it's the positron and the electron, uh, they <laughs> annihilate to make photons, uh, which are a form of energy in the electron <coughs> But you can make uh, matter and antimatter turn into energy in other forms, too. So the big thing here is that you can unleash the energy of the mass of these particles. And it's really a lot of energy if you can make a lot of energy. Yeah, now you know the science of energy. Uh, the thing I have to tell you, though, is that antimatter is not all that uncommon. Actually, I have here some antimatter. Never before accomplished in a, in a public lecture endangering the audience. This is a danger of antimatter, right? Um, here is perhaps the most common form of antimatter with which you come in contact. Why am I talking about bananas? Well, um, bananas are a source of potassium, which is why your mother made you eat them so often. And it turns out most potassium is a stable uh, substance, except some of it does decay. It's radioactive. And when it does decay, it emits antimatter. It actually emits anti-electrons. Not very much of it, and which is why it's kind of safe, uh, but about 0.01%. When whole 1% of all naturally occurring potassium is actually radioactive and emits anti-electrons. And so it's very likely, if you were sitting next to a banana, that some of the anti-electrons would come out and hit you in the head and annihilate something in your head. <laughs> <laughs> if you're um, sensitive to salt and uh, worry about your blood pressure or something, you use a substance called salt substitute, which is um, kind of like sodium chloride, except it's potassium chloride. And you take your little Geiger counter and put it right up near your potassium chloride, and you know, it starts ticking a whole lot more. Okay? Every little tick there is the death of an anti electron. Okay? It's annihilated on some electron. All that has happened is it's been ignited by some nucleus and just found another electron somewhere in the salt and it's annihilated. So you can, you can right there say that you've seen antimatter and matter annihilations um, in minute quantity. If you eat a banana, about the amount of time it would take for that banana to pass through you, in that time, about a thousand anti-electrons would have annihilated somewhere in your body. So that's not a big deal. But just know it's happening. <laughs> well, antimatter is common stuff. Actually, we use it all the time. Now, for those of us who have got to go to the doctor and get a PET scan, you have been injected with antimatter. So typically what happens uh, in a PET scan is they inject you with a radioactive substance, uh, mildly radioactive, uh, so that's, that acts as a tracer element that goes throughout your body. And depending on what it is, it tends to collect in certain places. So sometimes they, uh, they don't uh, glucose, which will tend to collect in certain organs or near your brain. 
and then they're in decay. So when, of course, the anti-electrons come out and annihilate on electrons, it's emitting gamma rays all over the place. And they sit there with some imaging detectors and see where the gamma rays come out from you, and that's where the antimatter uh, had been annihilating. So uh, we use it all the time in the diagnostics, in the diagnostics and as people have developed accelerators for uh, scientific purposes, they've also been using them in parallel to make various radioactive isotopes like carbon and fluorine and oxygen, all things that could be injected into a tracer element and then used for imaging. <laughs> and some of these pictures are kind of cool. Uh, so here's, for example, a picture of someone's brain during normal sleep. And there's some blood flow going on because all the blood is carrying this glucose on the upper brain, and you can see it. Uh, except if you let it go a little bit longer and watch that person during REM sleep when uh, you're, you're having uh, dreams and your brain is a lot more active, you can see various centers that are now colored in much more because uh, the brain is consuming a lot more of that glucose for food. And so it's sucked in inadvertently all that radioactive tracer element, which is now causing matter and matter annihilation in the brain. And they do all kinds of great stuff with PET scans. The picture on the left here um, is to show you once again what your mom told you, don't smoke, please, because uh, here is a picture uh, that shows normal person's organs and then a person who's an avid smoker, uh, their organs. Notice there's not a lot of blood flow going to some of those organs, okay, including your brain. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, is a pair of PET scans for a person before and after they've gone, undergone chemotherapy for bone marrow cancer. And here they were trying to assess, does the chemotherapy work? And indeed, it looks like uh, there's an awful lot less going on inside that person's bone marrow after the chemotherapy, but it's not all been cured. And what an amazing tool that is, because sometimes, and I don't know how, how many of you have been unlucky uh, to have a, a person in your family or a friend who's gone through cancer treatment, but you've got to go months wanting to know whether or not the cancer treatment was effective, and you don't really know until it has come back. And so now, in more or less real time, you can monitor the progress of trying to kill off mm -hmm. that cancer through a pet scan. I like this hat. You can actually find that on some uh, uh, support groups uh, website. You can buy that. If I have one more pet scan, I can go blow. The other place we can commonly uh, uh, see antimatter is in cosmic rays. There are constantly particles being uh, hitting us from the upper atmosphere, from outer space, all the time. And these things, these cosmic rays have tremendous amounts of energy, and they unleash huge showers of particles that are coming down and hitting you. There are about a thousand muons and antimuons hitting you every second, just in the area of one hand. So your whole body, several thousand. And there are constantly antiparticles in that collection, too. For those of you who are not very familiar with cosmic rays, think of the aurora borealis or the northern lights. That's a visible uh, way of saying I saw some cosmic rays because that shower of particles is emitting light in the upper atmosphere. There are always particles uh, hitting us. So this is a picture taken by some physicists where a cosmic ray is coming in and then blasting the part of the nucleus uh, inside a piece of photographic film and you can see these things release huge amounts of energy. The, the particular tracks here in yellow I've highlighted are notable because they are electrons and anti-electrons. So those, uh, again, signs of matter in any kind. And this is the inverse of the thing that's talked about in the movie. In the movie, they're very worried about matter and antimatter annihilating and making energy. This is a quantum of energy, a photon, that's been splitting up in, in, the, in, path, in the path of this photographic film and making an electron and anti electron. We also study anti electrons and anti, -positive, or anti protons all the time in accelerators. Um, there are lots of accelerators around the world that produce antimatter, not just CERN. In fact, CERN is not the one that produces the most antimatter, that's at Fermi Lab. Uh, this is a picture of a low energy anti proton coming in and annihilating the proton, which you don't see, and making a spew of particles. Okay, so we, we do matter antimatter research all the time, not the top secret. What is of concern in the movie, however, <laughs> is that if you really could get a quarter gram of antimatter, that's a big deal. Okay? So they say in the movie, in that little clip that we just looked at, that a quarter gram of antimatter is equivalent uh, to about five kilotons of TNT. Actually, that's not quite right, because that quarter gram of antimatter would annihilate a quarter gram of matter. So you get to take credit for twice the amount of mass that you'd be annihilating. That's a 10 kiloton bomb. 
So to give you a sense of how big a 10 kiloton uh, bomb is, that's uh, very close to the size of the bomb that blew up Hiroshima. Okay, that's a 15 kiloton bomb. And 15 or 10 kilotons, what does that mean? It means that you're carrying along enough TNT to fill 100 uh, bus cars in a freight train. So this is a very, very big explosive device. If it was really true that you could uh, assemble a, a little vat of antimatter equivalent to a quarter gram, which weighs about the same as a piece of a dollar bill, that is a very big explosive. Okay, so we really should work. Except. <coughs> It turns out, at, at our current rate of production of antiprotons at Fermilab, which is the largest factory of brand antimatter, it would take us about 109 million years to make a quarter gram of antimatter. <laughs> we don't make that much. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not even a technology thing. It's just we don't have any tools. This is the laws of physics. So the way we make antimatter is to slide a slam a proton into a target of carbon, and you get a few particles out, and it turns out only one in a million is an antiproton. So we're, we're never going to accumulate uh, that much antimatter by the laws of physics at the rate of production of, of antimatter at Fermi level. And it's not a very efficient process, it turns out. It takes us a lot of energy to create a high-energy accelerator beam and throw it at a target and make just that little ripple of antimatter. In fact, it takes so much energy, if you really wanted this explosive device, you would have to consume all the energy the world equivalent to what the world consumes for 30 years. Someone's going to notice. <laughs> It's also not terribly portable. Uh, antimatter, they, in, the, in the movie, they have this little bat, like gay big, and they say there's a little electric and magnetic fields suspending the antimatter in this chamber. Well, you need to have the electric and magnetic fields there because if it touches the walls of the container, of course, it's going to annihilate the walls, and that's very bad for the, uh, the bomb layer, so we don't want that. But the true bats, or the magnetic bottles that people uh, that have actually developed, are more like that size in the right hand picture. It's about the size of a room. Okay, so you're not going to be walking around with this before someone notices. And furthermore, you can't shut it off, right? Because otherwise, it's going to hang down to the wall. And the real research uh, to do kind of magnetic trapping or, or even laser trapping of atoms is pretty cutting edge stuff. That was a Nobel Prize in 1997 uh, by Stephen Chu, who is now our Secretary of Energy. Uh, and it's still you know, an active area of research. Trapping and containing single atoms or single particles or even clouds of particles. Uh, is right at the forefront of, it, of, of physics. People don't walk around with little bottles in their pocket. So uh, if you're interested, and, and you know, there, there are faculty here at UT that, that do this kind of work. The other thing that's funny about the, the book, not mentioned in the movie, is it's alleged that uh, CERN has this X33 space plane, which is kind of cool. Uh, I'd like to have one in my lab. Um, and I suppose that it's mentioned in the book because there's are there, they're talking about propelling and using antimatter as the propelling device. Well, that's even a lot more antimatter that you would need. You would need something like the amount of antimatter put up to your fist. Uh, that's a lot of antimatter. It takes us 100 million years just to make a quarter gram, and it takes a lot more to make a fist. And in reality, I have to tell you that CERN has nothing even close to an X33 uh, space plane. The more typical vehicle at CERN uh, looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> research in physics, the reason we care about it is because we, all of our models of how the Big Bang actually unfolded would be uh, involving huge amounts of matter and huge amounts of antimatter in roughly equal proportions, in fact, exactly equal proportions. And everything we know about how to write down a, a theory for particle physics has equal mass of matter and antimatter. So it's kind of a mystery to us in physics why we don't have any antimatter today. When Neil Armstrong stepped out on the moon, he didn't blow up. The moon was made of matter, too. And so somehow, we live either in a localized part of the universe that's only full of matter, or all the antimatter has disappeared. So this is an active area of research, and we all wonder why everything didn't annihilate, or how is it that we ended up with that last little trace of matter that's left over. And there are lots of uh, experimental uh, efforts going on, uh, including by faculty here in, in the Department of Physics. Uh, Jack Ritchie and Roy Twitters were involved in an experiment where they produced huge amounts of particles and antimark particles in equal volumes, and they look at one decays uh, quicker than the other, because maybe that explains why the antimatter is all gone in the universe. It simply had 14 billion years to decay a little faster. Uh, Carl Lang and myself uh, are involved in an experiment using doing the same kind of thing involving neutrinos, wondering 
you know, do the neutrinos go away any faster than anti neutrinos? So far, no one has a smoking gun that really suggests we can explain why the matter is gone. Uh, the, the matter is left over in the universe and not the anti matter. If you have any ideas, you know, let us know. The other thing that's mentioned in that film clip is this thing called the God particle. Uh, this is uh, more or less uh, taken as a, out of a book uh, by a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Leon Letterman, who was writing about frontier research in particle physics. Actually, he never called it the God particle, he called it the goddamn particle. <laughs> <laughs> it's because he's been on a lifelong quest to find this thing, it's really hard to find. If people had found it, you would have known. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, that got edited by a publisher. And it was by the name the God part of it. <laughs> it's one of the central goals of the LHC to find this thing. This thing called the Higgs particle, or the God particle, uh, it was conjectured back in the 60s to explain why all the other particles have mass. There's this great theory of elementary particle physics. It works beautifully well. The mathematics is so satisfying, and people are very happy to know that we have a unifying theory of particle physics. Except there's one problem. All the particles in this theory have zero mass. All particles in this theory have zero mass. And I don't. And neither do you. So we have a real problem in particle physics explaining how things got their mass, unless you have some things like the Higgs particle or the God particle. And if you uh, pay attention at all to the news, and if the Higgs particle is found, I'm sure that you will know about it, because it is, it is the mission of the LHC. It has also been a lifelong quest of physicists at Fermilab. So at Fermilab, they have had, up till now, the world's largest particle accelerator, and they've been looking for the Higgs particle, too. It's now a horse race because Fermilab has a few good years left in it, and CERN is now just starting to turn on. So you can think of a Samson and Goli or David and Goliath type uh, story here, uh, where you've got the, the, the underdogs and, and, the, and the big team coming in with the big guns. Uh, so whether one team races and wins or the other, we don't know. Uh, nature will tell us. But uh, it's certainly been an exciting few years in art physics, uh, uh, seeing who will discover the big part of it. Another advertisement I'd like to do is for this movie called The Atom Smashers. We'll be showing this movie uh, later in the semester uh, as part of our movie nights. It's a PBS documentary about um, the race to find the Higgs particle. It, it interviews lots of people at Fermi Lab and Star. It's, it's kind of a lot of fun. It's really good. Uh, so if you want, uh, you can sign up and receive emails about that or grab a flyer. Yeah, have a good pleasure. So let me play uh, one last clip for your amusement about angels and demons. And now that, now that you're all experts about particle accelerators and antimatter, you can sort of talk quietly about uh, some of the things you see in this clip. Beam stability is good. Take your place, these people. Let's hope the heavy island guys didn't mess up. Line has no restrictions. Enable beam capture. Accelerating the beam. Stage one. Right Back up the full field. No function system is back. Last P still too high. Yeah, we got moving on to go. Can't you turn it on? Check particle beams. Join the LHC. The collision is normative. We are moving in line. The capture should be initiated at the moment of impact. Collisions are fixed and running. LHC ejecting protons, beam one. Lock the feedback systems. Particles at 99% the speed of light. Lighting stable beams. Interact injection kicker. We have a signal on the luminosity monitors. We have events.
say one last couple of things. If, uh, some of you may have seen some t-shirts around campus uh, that are put out by the business department. If you would like one, you're welcome to, uh, to sign up for one at the end of tonight's uh, talk. And um, I want to just point out some websites that you can find out more information about managing matter and any matter of your life. And I'll just lastly uh, put in a couple of plugs for a couple of things that will be happening in the physics department this semester. One is the open house, which I referred to. It's an opportunity to tour all the labs here in the department, including the head of operations and others. Uh, and also the movie nights that will happen uh, first month, and first Tuesday of each month. So thank you all for coming, and I'll see you next time.